this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new recording from Hour of the Truth, Jogler 66, or Jörg Lissmann as you know me, together with my comrade over there in the United States of America, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. We are gathered here together via Skype today to do the 55th reading and discussion of the wonderful book End Time Delusions that Steve Wahlberg wrote some years ago and that is... Um, important in the past or was important in the past and is important now and also will be important in the future to show the people how we have been betrayed by many wrong teachings even by quote-unquote church fathers and that is the next chapter chapter 21 we are going to discuss today me and Tom Fress and that's why I want to warmly welcome Tom to the broadcast hello Tom Hello, Yerk. Nice to be with you and uh, the listeners today. And uh, I'm anxious to continue our reading and discussion of this wonderful book by Steve Wolberg, End Time Delusions. And I hope the listeners are uh, uh, edified and educated and uh, at least enough interested in the book to buy a copy of it, to read for themselves and to share with friends and family, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and to uh, apprise them of the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. The future 70th week of Daniel has deceived the entire Christian world and has single-handedly destroyed the Protestant faith. One of the prerequisites of being a Protestant is to maintain the protest against the man of sin in Rome, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy, is the papacy. And futurism has literally transferred 
Antichrist away from the papacy and put it on a single individual at the very end of time. And thus has blinded the eyes of every Christian as to the true identity of the Antichrist. While at the same time telling the world, the Christian world, that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future and thereby denying that Jesus was the Christ who fulfilled the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy 2,000 years ago. Now, can you think of a greater deception? One that single-handedly denies that the Antichrist is the papacy and at the same time denies that Jesus was the Christ. That's what futurism is. And that's what Steve Wolberg skillfully debunks in this book. And you've just simply got to have this book. That's all there is to it. And uh, and you'll soon see why when people ask me, <clears throat> Tom, why don't you write a book? It's easy. Steve Wolberg already wrote it. And... Uh, Certainly, you can tell that I've, I can add a great deal to what Steve Wolberg wrote. But if I were to include a book with all the details that we filled in, it would be an encyclopedia and not, to book, not just a book. And uh, most people wouldn't read it. Get Steve Wolberg's book and read it. And uh, if you are serious about this study, then listen to our recording of the reading and discussion of this book and essentially read that encyclopedia that could have been written about this book. Back to you, Yerk. Uh, thank you, Tom. I just wanted to add something you, because you said um, a Protestant, of course, um, doesn't know anymore that the Pope is the Antichrist um, or many Christians today don't know that the Pope is the Antichrist. I think and I also think that you will agree with me, the deception is even deeper. Many people say, oh, the Pope is the Antichrist. But then in the end comes the Antichrist. <laughs> yeah. uh, how many times, Tom, the last few times, as I remember when I put these recordings out on Wednesday in the premiere at uh, 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening, you were watching with me. How many times didn't we have people commenting on the video in the live chat saying, yeah, but when the final Antichrist comes, that's yeah. just another piece of cake. Yeah. And, and, and we always say, no, point. you are deluded. You are taken by futurism because the yeah. Antichrist, as you propose, is the futurist Antichrist. Exactly right. And when you, <clears throat> and when you have an understanding of that, um, what the churches teach with the Antichrist in the end, even the Pope of Rome now is the Antichrist, but then the Antichrist comes. When you believe that, then you are betrayed as everybody else who doesn't yes. believe that the papacy is the Antichrist in the first place. Yes, well, listen, uh, I've experienced this. I can speak with perfect understanding and perfect wisdom about this because I went through the same thing. And, and what I now understand is that I literally had one foot in futurism and one foot in historicism. I was trying to blend the two to make sense. And I came to the new understanding, the Protestant understanding, that every pope in succession from the very first to the last is the Antichrist of his day. But by the same token, I held to the futurist understanding that the Antichrist would be the last pope. You can't have it both ways, folks. And it's better to take all your feet out of futurism and put both feet in historicism, and then you'll understand. And, and it's a dead ringer when we hear some of the listeners uh, either say or write in the comments of our video, but what about the Antichrist that comes at the end of time? Uh, I'm here to tell you that the one that they think is going to be the Antichrist is going to be a false Antichrist. And then the 
once he is taken out of the way, the papacy will take over. Okay? So the whole futurist world is still on the precipice, even though they've got one foot in historicism and are coming slowly but surely to the realization that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. They're still holding in reserve this final futurist Antichrist, and I'm here to tell you he will not be the Antichrist, but an imposter that signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, that lets them build, build their temple and begin animal sacrifices again, and then after three and a half years breaks the treaty with the Jews, causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That is the false Antichrist. Okay? I have to You're say you something, Tom. Sorry yes. to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. When I first got to know you a few years ago now, I think six, eight, six years or something ago, yep. we met through people like Walt Stickel, Wayne Michael from Avenue of Light, yep. and I don't know who else, but I surely remember Wayne Michael, or whatever his name was. I mean, he never disclosed his real name. Sometimes yep. it was Wayne, sometimes it was Michael. He had the website Avenue of Light anyway, and he taught that BS. That's right. He was a futurist. And it took me some time to see through it to see what BS he was telling. In That's our right. meetings, he That's was right. even in our videos. That's right. Against my better judgment, but he was. And uh, he was a futurist. And this is not to expose Wayne Michael or whatever his name is from uh, Avenue of Light website. The point is that even Tom, who exposes futurism longer since uh, I have known him already, also was associated with that man. Yep. And that, of course, is taking away credibility of what you say. Yeah, I wasn't associated with him. He was an acquaintance, but only distantly uh, yeah but he was he was brought to you as an acquaintance by way, by I was way of aware speaking. of him and yeah. i was introduced to him as though he were some kind of authority on the subject yeah when in, in fact he wasn't yeah uh -huh. and, and with me the same i was i mean we are talking about six years ago or something i was really a baby christian at that time i gobbled up everything and uh, even i repeated his lie yeah. In the beginning, because I couldn't make the difference. And then Tom came and told me about Daniel 70th week. And then all of a sudden I understood that there is not the Antichrist. Yeah. So when the Antichrist uh, listen, listen, Tom, the point, the, the point that I just made, the point that I just made was the deception is so subtle that even Christians today or Protestants today fall for that deception. I just yeah. want to say I fell for it too. Yeah. But I came out of it yeah. because of the grace of God, of studying yeah. the word for what it is, and understanding in the first place Daniel chapter 9 completely, correctly. Yeah. That's the key that opens the door to much better understanding that you could have ever imagined. Yeah. And when Tom and I very often comment on the people out there think this and the people out there think that. We don't do that condemningly or from a high place looking down at others. We were once in the same situation. Yeah. And we just want everybody to be as understanding in this, uh, in, in this prophecy, in this truth, biblical truth, as we are today. That's why we point to these errors. Yes. Not to point out that you who watch this video now are an error or something. That maybe is yes. so. But you have to come to that understanding for yourself when you measure up everything that you have learned in this world or in the church or on YouTube videos or whatever and measure it up to the Bible and then see if you have been betrayed or not. And this the Antichrist, even that teaching crept in our little congregation, we were, what, five, six people maybe at the time? Yeah. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. with, with Walt Stickel, Michael Adams, uh, Wayne Michael, you, me, and maybe Dave. I don't know. Uh, and, and that's I about it. That's about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, even in those little uh, uh, groups, that error crept in. Yep. Well, that's why the Bible says wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name and them, it's, I will be not five or six or seven or more. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it all comes back to that time. and I, I just want to warn the people. And now it has been years later, and now all of a sudden I just see the mistake that I was sure. in at the time. And now yeah. you can understand why I disfellowshipped. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'd had enough of the error. I was beginning to comprehend what what futurism really entails. And I also was understanding more thoroughly and more perfectly what historicism is. And I was seeing the attempted mixture of the two. And uh, I couldn't tolerate it anymore. And uh, I came out. And I'm never going back. And it's just time for others to repent of their futurism. And, uh, it, listen, it's it's an easy trap to fall into. It it makes apparently, initially at least, so much sense. But before long, as your your understanding of historicism continues to grow and per, and be perfected. More and more futurism has to go. It's incompatible. And uh, and besides that, historicism makes much, much more sense of every kind of sense. Common sense, scriptural sense, biblical sense, prophetic sense. And pretty soon, histor- historicism becomes the truth. And there's no competitor with it. No one even, nothing even comes close. And futurism all of a sudden begins to, to appear openly as the laughing stock that it is. It's a laughing stock. And guess who's laughing at us for believing it? Rome, the Antichrist, the papal Antichrist. And every pope is the Antichrist of his day. Don't look for a future Antichrist because he's the here and now. And uh, and that's always been the case through almost in the entire Christian era. The Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy reigned over the kings of the earth, wore out the saints of the Most High, deceived the saints of the Most High, killed the saints of the Most High, persecuted the saints of the Most High. History has recorded it, the scripture predicts it, and history shows the fulfillment. Why do we need a future Antichrist? Only to blind our eyes to the real one, the historical one, the here and now Antichrist. And he successfully defeated the Protestant Reformation with this futurist Loda Hui. There is no Protestantism in this country. You cannot be a Protestant without the belief and the protest that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And you can walk the streets of this so-called Christian country, and you can but find a handful of those who still believe that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. They're as rare as hen's teeth. You simply cannot find them. As a percentage of the population of this country, Protestants are minuscule. So, futurism has done its damage. I can't name you a war in history that so routed the enemy as to make them non-existent. But that's what the army of the popes did, starting with the Council of Trent. They annihilated Protestantism. And it should never have happened. And now we're exposing the deceivers, those who have deceived us, and with what they have deceived us. 
And now it's time for us to repent. To repent. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. This is really necessary that we go into this a little bit, even though many people will say, there they go again with a big introduction. <laughs> but I don't care what people say. I think this is necessary to be repeated. Because the lie is repeated so many times, the truth cannot be repeated too often anyway. So let's go into the promised reading of this wonderful book from Steve Wahlberg. Chapter 21 is called The Faith of Our Fathers. And of course, the word fathers should be put in quotation marks unless he really speaks of his biological father. He probably doesn't. And that's why it should be put in quotation marks, because Jesus Christ said, call no one on earth your father, but you have one father who is in heaven, or which is in heaven. It starts with a quote from Alexander Vinette, who lived between 1797 and 1847, so he only got 50 years old. And he said, Protestants there are, but Protestantism is no more. <laughs> well, this saying could have come from Tom Fress right away from the press, I tell you. That's exactly <laughs> right. And look at the dates. 1797 to 1847. And what have I been saying? That Protestantism died when Futurism began to be taught in the Protestant and Evangelical seminaries in England in 1805 to 1810. And here we have this quote from Alexander Vinet says, Protestants there are, in other words, those who still profess to be Protestants, but Protestantism is no more. And what is Protestantism? The belief that, number one, Jesus is the Christ, and number two, the papacy is the Antichrist. That's why he says, with knowledge, Protestantism is no more. Why? Because futurism was adopted and accepted in the Protestant and evangelical seminaries in England, and eventually it would destroy, it would spread all over the world and destroy Protestantism wherever it existed. And that's exactly what has happened. And you know that normally I look up Bible quotes that are more interesting than the quotes the author puts here in the beginning of his chapter. But to my big respite, uh, to replace anything from the Bible, what Alexandre Vinette said, I didn't find anything. So I just give you the link who Alexandre Vinette was, and you can open up the Wikipedia link when you download the book from myarchive.org, where this link is included in the uploaded uh, edition of this book. The gloves are off, and the battle is launched between the forces of good and evil for the very souls of men and women around the globe. So says Left Behind's eight book, quote, The Mark, the Beast Rules the World, unquote. That is the title of that book, Inside Cover. Unfortunately, Left Behind's entire drama places the rise of the beast itself, the enforcement of its deadly mark, and the final end-time battle between the forces of good and evil only after the rapture. Now, let me tell you something. Again, today I received an email from someone watching one of the latest, latest videos of this reading, asking me, Jörg, what is your stance on the rapture? I mean, we've spoken abundantly about that in earlier broadcasts, so please watch all videos of this reading. Don't just pick here and there one, because then you will never get the full picture. I know that very often Tom repeats himself. I know that I very often repeat myself. But you have to live through that. Or otherwise, don't ask these silly questions, because we've dealt with the rapture abundantly during the reading and discussion of this book. There is no biblical rapture. The rapture, even the word, is not in the Bible, 
and is completely Roman Catholic dogma. Has nothing to do, has absolutely nothing to do with anything biblical. Yeah? Now, you're, you know as well as I do, even as we speak, there are listeners to this program who don't know what we've taught. And I can teach it, and I can do it in less than three minutes. The Bible plainly tells us, the Bible plainly, explicitly tells us that Christ cannot return until that man of sin is revealed. Okay? There were those who were preaching that Christ had already returned in the Spirit, and it brought great upheaval and worry and consternation among the saints, and Paul corrected them. Christ has not yet already returned, and he will not return until that man of sin is revealed. But in the future, in the futurist uh, delusion, they preach the coming of Christ first and then the revelation of Antichrist. They say the rapture, which is the coming of Christ, takes place first and then the Antichrist is revealed. So who's telling you the truth? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe Paul, or are you going to believe the futurist liars behind the pulpits of all the churches in this country? My money's on Paul. Paul told the truth. Paul said Christ will not come until that man of sin is revealed. Futurists say Christ comes first, and then the man of sin is revealed. There's your answer. And it, it, it cannot be wrong. No one can gainsay it. No one can contradict it, no matter how eloquent they are, no matter how many video series uh, they produce in order to defend their false interpretation of Bible prophecy. It cannot be true. It is not true. And you should not believe it unless you love and maketh a lie. Now, have we handled it? And I did it in less than three minutes. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, that's um, in less than three minutes. You were very, you did that very well. Yeah, I always have to check my buttons. To see if I <laughs> unmute myself. Okay, I did. Good. So let's continue in this reading. It's no secret, says the author, that this is also the teaching of these much respected prophecy teachers, Dr. John Walwood, Tim LaHaye. Thomas Ice, Hal Lindsay, Jack Van Impe, John Hagee, Arno Fruzzi, Peter Lalonde, Chuck Smith, and Grant Jeffrey. With the utmost fairness and without judging anyone's heart or destiny, it is proper to place these men in the futurist camp. On the preterist side today, either partial or full, we have such influential leaders as Gary DeMar, Kenneth L. Gentry, uh, Jr., uh, Kenneth L. Gentry Jr., David Chilton, R.C. Sproul, Max King, James Stewart Russell, Samuel M. Frost, and John Noe. To these scholars, generally speaking, the beast is not on the horizon. He's dead. When Nero breathed his last foul breath and gave up the ghost, so much for Antichrist. It is the conviction of this writer meaning Steve Wahlberg, that both preterists and futurists have unknowingly left behind some of the Bible's most solemn truths. And now it's, get in, it's getting interesting. There comes a sentence with a lot of names, and then I'm going to read to you what the sentence every uh, actually means, because it's much shorter. That's in the yellow color. Through their acceptance of futurist and preterist viewpoints about Antichrist, in contrast to the teachings of John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, Calvin's Institutes, the original Westminster Confessors, the translators of the King James Bible, Sir Isaac Newton, James Edgar Wiley, Merle Dubigny, Henry Gretton Guinness, John Wesley, Matthew Henry, Albert Barnes, John Bunyan, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, 
E.B. Elliot, Jonathan Edwards, Bishop J.C. Ryle, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Ian Paisley, Alan Campbell, Dr. Francis Nigel Lee, Mrs. M. Kinstry, D. Roy L. Hannon, Hansen, Dr. Fel, Vel Finnell, Mark Finley, Robert Caringola, and countless, countless other historic Protestants, these preterists and futurists don't know who the real beast is. Coming to the core of the sentence, in contrast to the teachings of all the names I just listed, these preterists and futurists mentioned in the um, paragraph before don't know who the real beast is. You see that I deleted the name of Doug Batchelor and I dare you do your own research why I deleted him. Yes. Can I make a comment here? Oh, sure, Tom. You always can make a comment. Look, uh, it needs to be dwelt on a bit. The honor and respect that is granted to the late R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul was not a historicist. And R.C. Sproul was probably one of the most influential scholars, uh, seminarian scholars and uh, preachers in in our generation and he had many that he influenced one of which uh who's i always have trouble uh, bringing up his name and the baptist pastor um oh for heaven's sakes john macarthur heavily influenced john macarthur and to this day, I watched just last week a video of John MacArthur, who was talking about the Antichrist. And he whizzed through that sermon so fast, you couldn't understand what he was talking about. Why? Because he knows he's wrong. And he will not repent. He will not repent of his error. And he knows he's wrong. And why is he holding on to his error? Because he doesn't want to diminish the reputation of his mentor, R.C. Sproul. Well, I'll tell you what, it's way too late for honor. It's way too late for egos. It's time to admit the truth. R.C. Sproul was wrong. John MacArthur is wrong. Now, let's get out the sackcloth and ashes and get on with it. John MacArthur could be a great voice for the truth in this country if he would just repent of his futurism. And uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure that I've offended many listeners with, uh, with the, uh, the likes of my uh, chastisement of R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur, but I don't retract one word of it. Not one word of it. And uh, it's time for us to get real. It's too late to play religious politics. And uh, we're all fallible men, even R.C. Sproul and even John MacArthur. So let's, let's admit the truth and forget the lies and get on with Christ. Back to you, Yerk. Well, Tom, you should not be sorry. Uh, because the truth always uh, embarrasses or uh, insults those people who live in the lie and who are even happy living in the lie. Well, that's, that's the biggest problem, that they even enjoy living in the lie. They say, I know the truth, but I don't care because the lie is just like sweet honey on my lips. Listen, the lies are profitable. The lies sell. The lies will make you famous. And they have. Both R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur. And if they won't repent of their sins, walk away. Turn and walk away. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So let's continue in the book. We know the truth, he says. Yet our eyes have been opened, he says. Yet our eyes have been opened, the preterists and futurists of the paragraph above not, 
but our eyes have been opened. We know the truth. And what do you gain by knowing the truth and keeping it for yourself? Didn't Jesus Christ say that when you have a candle, that when you have a light, you don't put it under a bed when nobody sees it? When you know the truth, you should put out the truth. And that's what Tom and I are doing with doing these readings and these videos. What you do with it, that's up to you. And that's up to the grace of God, whether he opens your understanding or he doesn't. That's not up to us. But we will putting out and keep putting out the truth until our last breath. We know the truth and we don't gain anything with it if we don't share it with the people out there. Now it won't be easy, but with the Bible in our hands and God's love in our hearts, we must stand up for the revelation of Jesus Christ, as it says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. And solid prophetic truth, no matter what the cost. Huh? Oh, I butchered the sentence a little bit. It won't be easy, but with the Bible in our hands and God's love in our hearts, we must stand up for the revelation of Jesus Christ and solid prophetic truth, no matter what the cost. It is my hope, says Steve Wahlberg, and my prayer that God will impress the minds of many well-known TV evangelists, radio hosts, seminary professors, best-selling authors and ministry leaders, whether they be futurist, preterist, protestant and catholic, to reconsider their positions. Hopefully, like noble ships with a new command from their captain, they will yet change their course. As we near the end of this Antichrist delusion section, I want to focus on the lesson of faith and courage, of standing up for Jesus and his prophetic truth, turning away from futurist fiction with its imaginary Nikolai, you know, end time Mr. Bad Guy, and also the preterist persuasion of a long buried Antichrist like Nero, Caligula, and so on, we are about to look at the real account of a man who battled the beast in history. This conflict took place in the 1400s, during the time of the famous Roman Catholic Council of Constance, in Constance, Germany, on the border to Switzerland. The council met on November 1st. Oh, isn't that uh, All Saints Day? <laughs> Do you think that is a coincidence that that council starts on quote-unquote All Saints Day? Yeah? 1414, and continued until April 22nd, 1418. The total number of the clergy alone present at the council, though perhaps not all of them all the time, was four patriarchs, 29 cardinals, 33 archbishops, 150 bishops, 134 abbots, 250 doctors and lesser clergy, we are speaking not of medical doctors, but of doctors of the church, of course, amounting to 18,000. With the emperor and his train, kings, dukes, lords and other, no uh, other nobles, the members were ordinarily 50,000. At certain periods of the conference, there were as many as 100,000 present. 30,000 horses were fed, and 30,000 beds were provided by the city. In our modern terminology, we would have said, this is a big event. Parking is limited. The Council of Constance condemned the writings of John Wycliffe of England, who lived in the 14th century, meaning in the 1300s. Wycliffe taught at Oxford University and has been called the Morning Star of the Reformation. And the movie John Wycliffe, the Morning Star, was awarded the title Best Film from the Christian Film Distributors Association. Now, here is a link where you can watch this video on my BitChute channel because I have uploaded it there. I couldn't upload it on YouTube because of copyright issues, but I uploaded it on BitChute and I advise everybody to see it and I put the link from this book that I have it in uh, directly into the description, this, 
directly into the description box of this video so that everybody is, po uh, is able to click on it and watch that video on BitChute. John Wycliffe, The Morning Star. Before Martin Luther, John Wycliffe protested against Rome, was the first to translate the Bible from Latin into English, taught salvation by faith in Jesus Christ alone, placed the word of God above popes and kings, and openly declared paper Rome to be the great antichrist of prophecy. The Council of Constance, more than 40 years after Wycliffe's death, decreed that his decaying bones should be dug out of his grave and publicly burned. His ashes were triumphantly thrown into a nearby crook. That is, by the way, called the Swift, if I'm not mistaken. This book, says an old writer, hath conveyed his ashes into Avon, Avon into Severn, Severn into the narrow seas, they into the main ocean. And thus, the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblems of his doctrine, which now is dispersed the world over. So by putting his ashes into the little river or brook or whatever, they wanted to make him forgotten and they didn't think of that all brooks and all rivers eventually flow into the sea. And that spiritually, what Wycliffe taught was now going all around the world. And that's what we see a little bit later, when the Protestant, uh, Protestant Reformation came into another gear with Martin Luther and Bibles were translated into the common language of the people and distributed worldwide. They shot an own goal, you would say, in football terms, for as far as I'm familiar with football. But there was another very important person at the Council of Constance, and that was John Huss of Bohemia. And also I have a video on John Huss that I couldn't upload on YouTube on BitChute and also the link is not only provided here in the book but will also be provided in the description box of this video. So click on it and you can watch this wonderful movie of John Huss. That's how you pronounce him in English, right? John Huss, you say. Jan Huss, we say in German. John Huss of Bohemia read the writings of John Wycliffe and continued many of his reforms. After denouncing Wycliffe, the Council of Constance summoned John Huss also, condemning him to the flames. Jerome of Prague was a good friend of Huss, and in April of 1415, before the martyrdom of Huss, Jerome arrived at Constance, hoping to help his friend. Unfortunately, he was seized by his enemies, cruelly dragged out through the streets in chains and promptly thrown into a dark, miserable, rat-infested dungeon. For almost a year, he was transferred from cell to cell. At last, he was brought before the council. Fox's Book of Martyrs declares that before that vast assembly, these false charges were read against him. First, he was a derider of the papal dignity. Second, he was an opposer of the Pope. Third, he was an enemy to the Cardinals. Fourth, he was a persecutor of the Prelates. And fifth, he was a hater of the quote-unquote I add Christian religion, because it should read he was a hater of the Roman Catholic religion. Jerome was commanded to accept Roman, Romanism or be consumed at the stake. Weakened by almost a year of horrible treatment, Jerome's faith wavered and he agreed in some measure to submit to Rome. But after he was returned to his rat-infested cell, he saw more clearly what he had done. He thought about his friend John Huss, who perished in the flames. He thought about Jesus Christ, the Saviour, whom he had pledged to serve and who, out of love for Jerome's lost soul, had endured the full justice of God's holy wrath against sin and the incomprehensible pain of separation from his father. Before his cowardly decision to compromise, Jerome had found comfort amid his sufferings in the assurance of heaven's favour. But now, Remorse and doubts 
tortured his soul. He knew other compromises must be made before he would be released, which could only end in his complete apostasy from God's truth. As he looked into the whiskered faces of rats and felt cockroaches crawling around his toes, Jerome made his decision. He would no longer deny his Lord. Jerome was brought again before the council, but this time he was determined to boldly confess his faith and to follow his friend John Huss to the flames. He publicly renounced his former denial and demanded, as a dying man, an opportunity to make his defense. He protested, quote, You have held me shut up 340 days in a frightful prison, in the midst of filth, noisomeness, stench, and the utmost want of everything. You then bring me out before you, and lending an ear to my mortal enemies. You refuse to hear me. If you be really wise men, and the lights of the world, take care not to sin against justice. As for me, I am only a feeble mortal. My life is but of little importance. Unquote. His request was finally granted. In the presence of Europe's judges, priests and nobles, Jerome knelt down and prayed for the Holy Ghost to take control. Jerome then gave an uncompromising defense in behalf of truth. Referring to John Huss, he firmly declared, quote, I knew him from his childhood. He was a most excellent man, just and holy. He was condemned notwithstanding his innocence. I also am ready to die. I will not recoil before the torments that are prepared for me by my enemies and false witnesses, who will one day have to render an account of their impostures before the great God whom nothing can deceive. Of all the sins that I have committed since my youth, none weighs so heavily on my mind and cause me such remorse as that which I committed in this fatal place, when I approved of the inquitious uh, inqui sentence Iniquitous, sorry, when I approved of the iniquitous sentence rendered against Wycliffe and against the holy martyr John Huss, my master and my friend. Yes, I confess it from my heart and declare with horror that I disgracefully quailed when, through, through a dread of death, I condemned their doctrines. I therefore supplicate. Almighty God to pardon me my sins, and this one in particular, the most heinous of all. Unquote. Raising a bony finger toward his judges, he declared, quote, You condemned Wycliffe and John Huss. The things which they affirmed and which are irrefutable, I also think and declare like them. Unquote. His hearers were stunned. Shut him up! screamed his enemies. What need have we of further proof? We behold with our own eyes the most obstinate of heretics. Yet Jerome stood unmoved, like a mighty rock amidst a hurricane. He thundered back. What? Do you suppose I fear to die? You have held me in a frightful dungeon, more horrible than death itself. You have treated me more cruelly than a Turk, Jew or Pagan. And my flesh has literally rotted off my bones alive. And yet I make no complaint, for lamentation ill becomes a man of heart and spirit. But I cannot but express my astonishment at such great barbarity toward a Christian. He was seized by his guards and hurried back to the rats, beetles, and vermin. Jerome was again visited in his ding, dingy, dingy cell and given one last chance to repent. 
Prove to me from the holy writings that I am an error, he responded. The holy writings, said one of his tempters, is everything to be judged by them? Who can understand them until the church has interpreted them? Jerome replied, Are the traditions of men more worthy of faith than the gospel of our Savior? Heretic! spat back his accuser. I repent having pleaded so long with you. I see you are urged on by the devil. Thus, Jerome, even though he was accused of being inspired by Satan, refused to bow down to the traditions of mere mortals. The Bible and the Bible only was his motto. This lesson is for us. We also may be accused of being a Lucifer of being Lucifer led when we turn from preterist persuasion, futurist fables, and best selling ideas, and also being deceived by many who pose for righteousness but are deceivers and wolves in sheep clothing and teach another form of futurism in the study of the book of Revelation. Nevertheless, with love in our hearts, we should stick to the holy writings, no matter what the cost. The Bible alone. The Bible alone, not just professing, but acting accordingly, is what we need to do. I tell you, the deception is even much deeper as we contemplated in this reading so far. But with the help of God Almighty, we will be led to repentance and a fuller understanding of His Holy Word. And that's my promise to you. When that deeper understanding by study comes, we will bring out many more videos. This will faint in comparison to what's going to come in the future when we continue our studies that we started a few weeks ago. And I think Tom supports me in that point, right? Yes, absolutely I do. I support you and this author and uh, the points that he has made. And uh, I have been supporting it for 20 years. Every day of my life, if I can help, if I if I can find the time and the listeners, that's what I've done. Now, I want the listeners to take a serious look at what the Romanists, what the papists, what the Roman Catholic kings and popes did to John Wycliffe, to John Huss, and to Jerome of Prague. What did they do? They persecuted the saints of the Most High. They tortured them. Even in the case of Wycliffe, dug him out of his grave and burned him at the stake. Is that not the persecution spoken of in the Bible by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, who would think to change times and laws to wear out the saints of the Most High, to persecute the saints of the Most High, the Pope who was drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus? Do you dare look for a future fulfillment of this when history literally drips with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus at the hand of the Antichrist of Rome? What foolishness you've been sold, a bill of goods, and you've forgotten the martyrs of Jesus. That's the whole point of all this futurism, so that you forget the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And we bought the lies, hook, line, and sinker. None of us is guiltless. Repentance is long overdue. Repentance is long overdue. And Rome is now perched high upon her lofty throne and is now in control once again of the kings of the earth. And she hates Protestants just as much as she ever did in the past. And now you know our destiny. If we do not repent. But there's no greater honor. Than to die a martyr of Jesus. 
and have our blood mingled with the saints. And if that's what it takes, so be it. There's an inquisition coming to God's house, the likes of which history has never recorded. But it will only be against those who reject the papacy as the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. Those who accept him, as most Christians do today, they won't suffer any persecution. They will be the persecutors. In the coming Inquisition, it won't be so many Roman Catholics who are lighting the auto de fe fires. It will be those who call themselves Protestants. Ecumenical evangelic bellies who think they were doing God's service when they burn you at the stake. Now, are you convinced of the truth? Or would you rather listen to more lies from your Protestant and evangelical pastors behind the pulpits of your churches? Or are you beginning to contemplate and understand why I tell you, get out of the churches. They are no refuge for God's people anymore. I will let the Holy Spirit guide and direct and convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's his calling. And with that, I'll turn it back to Yerk. Thank you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. You, you made a very good point when you said that uh, the persecution of the saints, as it is written in the Bible, uh, the three persons that you mentioned, uh, Wycliffe, Huss, and Jerome, are one example of. And what that reminded me on is that the Roman Catholic Church put on a paper a few years ago, I think it was about the year 2017 when the Reformation um, was uh, having that jubilee of 500 years, um, that is called from... Uh, Oh, what's it called? I got it on my main channel. From Conflict to Communion. And in that, they say on page 16, uh, we don't tell a different history, but we tell history differently. And I think that today we can see that uh, when you browse a little bit through the Internet, through YouTube, and especially through Roman Catholic sites, you can see that they say the Inquisition, as we know, and as it is recorded in many, many books, has never actually taken place. Now, why is that necessary? Well, when the persecution of the saints has not taken place yet, but takes place in the future, it fits their futurist agenda. Exactly. The future Antichrist. Just Google that a little bit. Denial of Inquisition. The Roman Catholic Church brought out papers where they said, oh yeah, there were 50 or 60 dead people in all the centuries of the Inquisition. They put these papers out and they mean it. They are breeding generations now who do not have the knowledge that we do because we read these old books. They will never know of the persecution of 500, 600, 700, 800, 1,000 years ago. They will only know of the last persecution. And then futurism to them makes all the sense. That's why it is so important that you study real history. And that you understand that the persecution of the saints has been going on for about 1,000 years today. Starting with the Crusades and the Inquisition in the 13th century, and the persecution of the Waldenses, of the Albigenses, of the Huguenots, of all these wonderful people who held up the word of God through the centuries. When all that is erased from the record of history, as the Roman Catholic Church doesn't tell in different history, but tells history differently, it can all start again. And that's what they want. Something to think about. Now, sentence was passed. 
and Jerome was led out to the very same spot where John Huss had yielded up his life. He went singing on his way, his face lighted up with joy and peace. His gaze was fixed upon Jesus Christ, the Prince of Life, so why should he fear Dr. Death? Arriving at the place of execution, Jerome once more knelt down to say a heartfelt prayer. He was tied to a stake as branches of wood were piled around his feet. When the executioner, uh, executioner stepped up to light the fire, this holy martyr claimed, exclaimed, Come here and kindle it before my eyes, for if I had been afraid of it, I had not come to this place. As the flames began to rise, Jerome prayed again. His last words were, Lord Almighty Father, have pity on me and pardon my sins, for thou knowest I have always loved thy truth. Do we love truth above tradition? Are we willing to stand up for Jesus Christ, the author of truth, and for the Holy Bible, no matter what the price may be? Dear reader, Jesus loves you personally. He has a special place in his heart for you and your family. He gave Jerome strength to stand up for what he knew to be right, and he will do the same for us. There is forgiveness only through the blood of the Lamb. Satan and mixed up men may kill the body, but they can't harm the soul. See Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 where it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Through the, though the beast makes war with the saints and overcomes them on earth, in Revelation chapter 13 verse 7, where it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. In heaven's eyes they overcame him by the flood of the Lamb, by the blood of, sorry, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, as if they did not love their lives to death. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, where it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. In our modern world of delta flights, plasma screens, TVs, and heavily traded mutual funds, may our hopes still echo the words of the classic 19th century hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. That was written by Frederick W. Favor. But Frederick, or Father Frederick William Faber, who was born in 1814 and died in 1863, was, noted, was a noted English hymn writer and theologian who converted from Anglicanism to Roman Catholicism in 1845. Like John Henry Newman did, right? He was ordained to the Catholic priesthood subsequently in 1847. His best-known work is Faith of Our Fathers. Quote, Faber left Elton to follow his hero Newman and joined the Catholic Church into which he was received in November 1845. You can read that in the Wikipedia link I will provide with this book as I put it in here. And that's why I will not read the quote that is here, because I don't read a quote from a Roman Catholic to end this wonderful 21st chapter of the book, End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg. And that is how far we are going to read this book. There's going to be a break now that I announced already to you and to Tom some time ago. And when that break is over, we will continue with exploding the Israel deception. And now I want to leave the last comment for today, as I always like to do for Tom. Please, brother. Yes, it's uh, time to acknowledge our Protestant heritage. It's time to renew the protest and therefore our relationship with our Savior. 
We cannot serve two masters. We cannot profess Christ out of one side of our mouths, but serve the Antichrist and and propound his lies out of the other side of our mouths. A choice has to be made. A clear and decisive choice. And with courage, we need to stand up to our oppressors, our papal oppressors, like did John Huss and Jerome of Prague and William Tyndale. The days of martyrdom are not over. There is a persecution of the saints. Are we persecuted today? No, because we don't protest the Antichrist of Rome. And it gives the delusion and the illusion that the United States is a quote unquote Christian nation. Listen, you may not agree with this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The United States is in no way Christian unless it is Protestant. It's in no way Christian unless it is Protestant. It must profess Jesus and denounce his nemesis, the papacy. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. And let us take our place among the martyrs of Jesus throughout history by fighting the same fight. The President de Joya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, but both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr. Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this house. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. 
Right, he remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. But let me say this, if the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in his group. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.